Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We, um, if you have learned Torah before, or you've not learned Torah before, if you've suffered through Sunday school or not, you're going to be great tonight. Everything's going to be perfect. I'm going to hand out a packet. The packet has sources in it. Now, a source is from our holy books, okay? It might be scary. It has Hebrew in it, and it has English in it. Okay, let's all take a deep breath. It's gonna be fun. It's really gonna be fun. We're, imagine you're going on a scavenger hunt, okay? And the scavenger hunt is gonna start in the Garden of Eden, and then it's gonna go through three stories in the book of Genesis, which you may or may not have heard of, and even you have not heard of them, it's totally okay. And then we're going to skip this for, oh, out of the book of the Torah, that's the extra scroll, and we're going to go to two sources in the oral law, the Mishnah. These are the pictures of the rabbis with the long beards that you imagine thinking about the great issues of life, okay? And then, believe it or not, those rabbis needed rabbis who were going to explain them 500 years later, and that is called the Talmud. We're going to look at a source in the Talmud. And then, and then, we're going to go to the 17th, 1500s, excuse me, and we're going to go to look at one of the commentators on that. And then at the end of that, we are going to have seen a beautiful pattern about the pillars, the three pillars of life, the ultimate balance. And when we're done with that, you're going to be able to say, oh, wow, why did Project 13 do a life seminar with these three topics? It's going to line up like ducks in a row. Okay, that's what we're gonna do. Okay, but so the process is like this. I'm gonna hand out things. We're gonna go over it first a little bit, and then we're gonna do a little bit of what's called chavruta. Can you say chavruta? That was good. You gotta get the Jewish chavruta. That was good. Okay, chavruta comes to the Hebrew word chaver, which means a friend. A friend, the ultimate friend, is someone that we grow in spirituality together, and that is a study buddy. So let us pass these out. We're going to do some of this together, and then we're going to set you on your own for a few minutes. It's like training wheels. You're going to have training wheels, then I'm going to take them off, then I'm going to put the training wheels back on, and you're going to be great. Okay? Please pa let me know if everyone gets one. I have more here if we need. Okay, I know when Shai gets it, he'll be, it'll be, we will have arrived. Okay, beautiful. We got it? Okay, here we go. All right, can I have a brave reader in English? This is the easy part. Loud. Who has a theater background? Oh, yes, okay, go ahead. Yes. Go ahead, I did call you out, go ahead. Just start from welcome. Welcome one and all to this exciting adventure of learning Torah. We are going to see just how relevant the Torah is to our lives today. We are going to track a pattern of thought that weaves its way from the beginnings of the Torah in Bereshit. Bereshit is good. Okay. I busted out the Hebrew on you. Good. Uh, through the oral Torah, the Mishnah, and the Gemara. Excellent. Deep breath. Don't be scared. Right, we did our deep breath. Okay, don't be scared. It will require you to think, to analyze, and to share your thoughts. Please know that this, this study session will help frame the life seminar. Have fun and grow. Okay, here we go. So we're going to do the first set, the first source together. Okay, and it works out actually great because the Torah portion this week is actually done in the beginning. It is this story of Genesis. Now, a little bit after the whole creation story comes along a guy and a gal named Adam and Eve. Or Adam and Chava, Chava. So if, it's like, Rabbi, who's the Chava thing over there? Okay, no, 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 this is not the uh, socialist leader of Venezuela, not Chavez, okay? This is Chava. Again, you know, to Jewish, you gotta have the ch Okay, uh, Chava. Chava comes from the word life because Adam gave her her name. She was the life giver of the world. She was the first mommy. And therefore, that became her name. Okay, but we're going to go straight to the controversy, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to go to where they sin. Melissa, you're doing such a good job. Can you just read the questions um, from what did Adam do wrong? And so we will all know what we're looking for. Look in source one there, number one. Yeah. Okay. Um, so read the yeah, just like what did Adam do wrong? Oh, there you go. Three quotes. Source. What did Adam do wrong? To get, uh, to get that, please carefully compare 
chapter 2, verse 6 through 7, 16 through 17, and chapter 3, verse 2 through 3. Uh, what did Chava do wrong? What was her motivation for disobeying Hashem's orders not to eat from that tree? Okay, so here we go. We are now going to try on a mystery hunt to look together. What did he do wrong? What did she do wrong? And from there, we're going to grow. All right, here we go. Can I have a brave reader turn the page source sheet? Here we go. I labeled the verses 15, 16, 17. Not bad. Can I have another brave reader? We're all going to get an opportunity to do this. Well, I know you all know the Hebrew, so we won't even bother with that. Okay, we'll just do it in the English for those who, uh, you know, may not speak it. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, yeah. Who, who could, who's up? Who's up? Okay, Sarah, thank you. Very good. Um, the Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to till it and tend it. Okay, I, tilling, I don't know. I, I know Aunt Tilly, but I don't know till. Till is a fancy word for it's like to plow it, to, to work the garden. Okay. Um, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you are free to eat. Okay. Keep going. Keep going. But as for the tree of knowledge of good and bad, you must not eat of it. For as soon as you eat of it, you shall die. Okay. So what's the basic instructions? Don't eat. Take care mm-hmm. of the garden. Take care of the garden. Good. Don't eat from that one tree. Yeah. And like, and like this is Garden of Eden. It's like, you know, clearly like beachfront property. It has at least as many trees as the Amazon rainforest. I mean, this is the Garden of Eden, right? So I'm at, what, there's like a million fruit trees? It's like, but Adam, you can hear the Jewish grandmother here. Adam, don't eat from that one. Just that one. Don't eat from it, Adam. And unfortunately, we're going to see what happens. Okay, so we got the instructions. All right, Sarah, that was excellent. Who can we pick on now? Come on, brave reader, want to get everyone involved here? Anyone? Anyone? Volunteers? Okay, Rachel, thank you. Um, now we're going to the serpent. Here we go. <laughs> now the serpent was the fruitest of all the wild beasts. The Lord God has made. He said to the woman, Did God really say, You shall not eat of any tree of the garden? The woman replied to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the other trees of the garden. It is only about fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden that God said, You shall not eat of it or touch it, lest you die. Okay, so that's what she says back. Keep going. Excellent, Rachel. And the serpent said to the woman, You're not going to die. But God knows that as soon as you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like divine beings who know good and bad. Okay, so let's stop right there. Now, let's hone in on what was Adam's sin. Adam's sin is a little more subtle, but Chava's is a little more obvious. But what did Adam do wrong? What does Chava say to the snake, to this sneaky serpent, that she's not allowed to do? In verse 3, what does she say? Eat or touch it. Eat or touch it. Nice. Good. See, it's that lawyer. You, you analyze papers all day, right? Right? So you're analyzing Torah verses now, right? So here we go. Right. Oh my gosh, we have two lawyers right in the same corner. Like, by the way, be careful what you say. We have two <laughs> lawyers here, okay? This is not... Oh, it's being recorded. Oh no. Okay. Anyway, okay. So, so why does she say that? What did God tell Adam? Don't eat it. Don't eat it. So what happened? She added the touch. She, a- she added the touch? She added the don't touch? Who added the don't touch? We don't know from the verses. You know, the Midrash says that Adam was worried that his wife was going to blow it. And there, see, he didn't trust her. That was his first mistake. And what? See, that's the, everything's downhill. Man doesn't trust his wife, that's it. Poor judgment. Okay, anyway, but what, what, what happened? He said, you know what? I want to make an extra fence over here. I want to make sure she doesn't eat it. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to tell her that don't eat it. Also, Chava, I should say babe. I don't say Chava, babe. That's probably not what he said. Okay, Chava, sweetie, don't even touch the tree because he wanted to make sure that there would be a fence there to prevent her from eating it. You know what the snake does in verse 4? Um, and the servant said to the woman, You're not going to die. You said that very well, Richard. I like the way you read it. The Midrash continues to say, You know what the snake did? He bumped Chava into the tree. She touched the tree. Did she die? Negative. Negative. She didn't die. 
So then he says, oh, well, if you didn't die when you touched it, certainly when you eat it, yeah. you're not going to die. And guess what? We're going to see. That's not the only thing that got her to eat, but that was the first thing. So the sin that Adam did was lack of clarity. He did not transmit this clarity. The other thing is he sort of took a little bit too much permission of his own. He's like, he didn't trust that God's word was enough. He said, okay, I got to add on to my own. Okay? So Maybe we're going to see. I'm sorry? Maybe he lied. So, I don't, so he had no reason to lie, but it was just, it was like a, a mistake of judgment. The question is, why did he want, he had good intentions. Did he? I think he did, for sure. There's no question. I mean, Adam was basically, you have to understand, who was Adam? No, 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 no. But I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because Adam, basically, you're talking about pure spirituality. There was no sin yet. There was no sin in the world now. You know, in other words, like, we're talking thousands of years later where, you know, for someone just to be a nice person is a major life. This is someone who was literally created by God, breathed his soul in. He's a pure soul. He has no ulterior motives. He had good motivations, but the problem was he, he made that mistake. Now, the plot Thicken. So even now, touch the tree. She doesn't die. Yeah? Sorry, Rabbi. You no, good. about the snake bumping uh, Eve to the tree, and you got that from the Midrash? Yeah, yeah. From, from the sages? Yeah. Like, interpreted that? It's all the Midrash, so, for sure. Like, this is, to me, it sounds like, a, you know, like lost in translation, or like the translation, right? So how did they, how did they translate that happen? When also like translation issues here between Adam so, and Eve. So when, so when we, so one of the things that we're going to get into, maybe not intensely, is what is actually the written Torah. If you had a bar bat mitzvah and you actually read out of the Torah scroll, right? What is that versus what we're going to see later, a Mishnah or the Gemara? And what is the relationship between them? So I'll give you just a, a silly example, Levi, and the, everyone else, right? If I would say, oh, <clears throat> I have a frog in my throat. No, what does that mean? Do I, do, I, do I have an actual frog in my throat? No, because I'd be down in the purple swan. Do they serve frogs too? Okay, right, right. So clearly I'm not gonna have a frog in my throat. But everyone knows exactly what I mean when I say I have a frog in my throat. That is an oral law. I only know that because we have an agreement here to know that that's an expression. When the rabbis are reading the Torah, they have, and even us, when we read it, we have an unbroken chain of all the frog in my throat, that's called the oral law, how to understand the writing. When it's, when it's an idiom, when it's an exaggeration, when is it literal, when is it not? That's a direct oral transmission from Moses, who actually wrote the Torah down, all the way down it, to this is day. Is specific to the Hebrew word that we're trying to interpret? Like, Some, like, when, like, for the sure. When Noah saw him, like they seen him naked, you know, we know what that means. A hundred percent. Sometimes. Is it, is it the word itself in Hebrew that it's like the poor translation? A hundred percent. I would say it's a poor translation. Sometimes it's an ambiguous word. Sometimes, sometimes the word has many connotations. Which one are you going to use? Okay, and then it's, it's case by case. It's case by case. But that is what, what the rabbis many times are fighting about is well, what's that word mean? Well, here it means that and that means that. And they both have legitimate tra uh, uh, transmissions of what that means. Okay, so we're, that's a, a, just a simple answer to a very deep question, which is a whole course of itself, and it's a great question. So, um, so now let's get back to Chava. Okay. Here's where the soap opera begins. By the way, this is better than any Netflix. I want you to know, this is better than any Netflix. This is the drama here. All of humanity is resting on what she and he are about to do over here. Okay, here we go. Now, verse six. Brave reader, someone hasn't read yet. Who's up? Natasha, can I bother you? Okay. Okay, go. Oh, you, have, you do have a frog in your throat. Is it okay? Mm -hmm. Can you do it? No. Maybe not. Okay, I'll pick on someone else. Shy, can I pick on you, Shy? All the Mexicans. The Mexicans, yeah. <laughs> Uh, when the woman saw that the tree was good for eating, and had light to the eyes, and was truly desirable, and a source of wisdom, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband, and he ate. Okay. All right. Okay, one more verse just for the sake of the story, and then I don't think we're going to finish. Go ahead, Shai. One more. Verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they perceived that they were naked, and they sewed together fig leaves and made themselves fully cloth. Okay. Zach, you had a question? Are there any lines in between, or are these... This is it. Straight. This is a live feed, ladies and gentlemen, straight from the Torah. Okay, okay. Yeah, no, no, it's great. Yeah, live feed. Yeah. Number three, you said it's Adam said that? Um, mm, yeah. Yeah, Adam said that. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So, what happened over here? Let's look very precisely. Turn back over here. What did she... What did the snake say in verse five? What was so tantalizing about this fruit? The snake said, yes, 
You're going to be like God. You're going to have a God-like powers. Okay? That's the first thing that happened. The next thing is, look in verse 6. What was it? It was good for eating and a delight to the eyes. If you look at the Hebrew, the Hebrew says it was a tava hila enaim. It was literally, um, it was literally the Hebrew's first over here. Yes, tava. The word tava we're going to see later on tonight means a desire, that burning, burning desire for that, for that chocolate cake for dessert or for you fill in the blank. Whatever vice that is, that is called good old fashioned taiva. It is the basis of Hollywood. It's the basis of much of our, uh, you know, entertainment industry and everything else like that. Good old fashioned unbridled passion for you fill in the blank, whatever people are passionate for. Okay, that's the second thing. And then what does she do? Turn uh, page two right at the top. What did she do? She shared. She shared. Sharing is caring. Okay, it says Rashi on the spot. Rashi is the major commentator. Why did she give it? She said to herself that I can't be in this state alone. I can't be in this state alone because she had already had this transformation. I need my husband literally to be brought down to my level as well. And she gave to him and he ate. Okay? And from those three things, now how am I going to get to that board? That is a great question. Okay, Rabbi Marcus, can I ask you a favor? You ready? Can I tell you what to write? Oh, well, Kiri will write? Okay. Actually, maybe that one's better. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Oh, yes, please, you can move it wherever you need to move it. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, here's what I want you to do. Can you um, write three things? The top one, we're going to make a chart going all the way across, but we're going to start just on the left. The top, gave fruit to Adam. Okay, next one down is going to be wanting to be like God. Okay, and then the last one down is the, well, the desire. The desire. So I would say uh, delight to the eyes. Desire slash delight to the eyes. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, from those three breakdowns, you're going to have the basis of all three relationships that exist in humanity. You ready to go the journey? Ready to do this now? Okay, so what do I mean? What I mean is that w in these three areas, the milk was spilt. We blew it in these three areas. We're going to define what these areas are shortly, and then we're going to see how our relationships today are going to line up with these three categories. Okay, so now the rest of the story goes like this. Humanity as a whole had opportunities to pick up the spilt milk, to clean it up. Unfortunately, unfortunately, they blew it. If you read the rest of Genesis up to chapter 12, it's one disaster after the other. Cain kills Abel, and then there's the generation of the flood, and Noah was saved, but the whole generation is wiped out. And then finally, they got this amazing technology to build this big building. Anyone heard of the Tower of Babel? Okay, okay, and they literally tried to get a tall tower to defeat God and to put God to rest. All right, so three strikes and you're out is, did not start with Major League Baseball. Three strikes and you're out started with the Torah because after humanity, one, two, three strikes, you're out, God had to go to the bullpen. Hope, no, no Astros fans here? Ooh, tough start. Ooh, okay. God went to the bullpen. He looked out in his world and he said, who are the moral people that I can go to who are going to clean up the spilt milk, to bring the world to perfection, to, to fix what Adam and Eve, Adam and Chava, blew? How are we going to bring this perfection? Guess who those three people were? We're going to learn about them right now. Okay, we ready? And um, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to set you on your way over here, and you're going to do source 2A together, and it's going to be the end of page 2 and all of page 3, okay? And I want you to turn to the person next to you, and I'm going to give you like three minutes. 
Three and a half minutes, maybe four minutes, okay? And here's what you're gonna do. You're not gonna read it silently like we did at Stanford in our library where we don't want anyone to like bother each other. We're gonna make a living Beit Midrash, which means that we're gonna be talking out loud, you're gonna read it out loud, and you're gonna discuss it together. Okay, so we're ready? Can we go two, 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 two? Oh, it's perfect, great, okay? Four minutes, we're gonna re read through these. And what I'd like you to do also, don't forget the first page. I'm gonna get, I'll just, we'll ask the questions together. In what area did Avraham excel? And in the situation is he was in, in his situation, what would you be doing? Okay, that's a little bit of a funny comment. All right, on your marks, get set, and read together. It should be loud in here, not like a library. Excellent. Tell me what's going on with Avram. What did God command Avram to do to himself and to all of his household members and his children? <laughs> yes, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Jewish male ritual that all Jewish men begin their lives eight days. Yes, it is actually a beautiful, beautiful ceremony, and it is very, very, it is actually beautiful. Can I say that Elijah the prophet is there on the spot there it is this, the holiness by the way if you ever need anything in your life really really badly i know this sounds crazy go to a bris at the time of the circumcision and the baby's crying those times are so tender all of heaven opens up okay anyway just an aside you should keep that in mind okay anyway can you imagine but this was not any other bris this was abraham who was how old 99. 99. Now, I don't know what 99 was back then, but it was not a millennial age, okay? And he goes and he circumcises himself because the Almighty says, God, you see, you know, the universe says, jump. And Avram says, ha ha, I'm all in. Okay, and then what happens the very next chapter? Abraham is sitting at the entrance of the tent, and it's a <sighs> hot day, okay? It's scorching hot. And all of a sudden, who appears? Well, it wasn't even three wise men. It was three regular shamil, shem shamazels, who were like walking in the middle of the desert, who come to his tent. And he's like, oh, I'm so glad you came. Come. Let you think I have problems moving around with a broken foot. Right, can you imagine? Okay, I can't even imagine, right? What he's going, oh, let me serve you this. And he's like barking out instructions. You know, oh, Sarah, you got to run here. And, and Ishmael, his son, at the time, whatever, you know, you got to run this and this and back and forth and running. It says he was running. Now, okay, ladies and gentlemen, if you're 99 years old and you just got a bris, okay, it was three days after your bris, and that's the question for you, what would you be doing? Not running. Not running. What? I, I, he, okay, here's, here's what I was after I broke my foot, okay, at age 46. I'm on the bed. Sorry, sorry it hurts. Can I have some water, please? I'm like this big baby. Okay, I broke my foot. Okay, I broke a bone in my foot. Okay, I can imagine without anesthesia that what Avraham experienced would be much more traumatic and painful. Okay, and what is he doing? He's bringing guests. Why? What's that show about him? What type of person was he? What? Yeah. <laughs> Gotta watch out for the lawyers. Okay. Yeah. He happened to have a ton of servants or whatever. But okay. Yeah. Right. He. What? What? I said. Yeah. He was welcoming. He was a giver. Hospitable. He was a giver. Avraham represents the trait of Chesed. Okay. And so, Kiria, can we write up on the top thing over there? Avraham, right next up to Gay Fruit, the next column. You've got to save room because the columns are going to be kind of thin. thin. So Avraham was the person who was a chesed. He was a relationship with others. So I would put Avraham and then just put relationship with others. Let's do that. Okay? Because his whole thing was kindness. All right? Now, we're ready? We're going to do a little, little fast over here. Okay? We're going to go to the next patriarch, Isaac. Okay, you ready for this next? Let's turn to page four. 
Okay, this is one of the most dramatic stories in the entire Torah. Do not ask me to explain it to you because it is beyond comprehension. God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. This is after Abraham spent his entire life preaching against the local idolaters. Don't involve yourself in human sacrifice. And God says, okay, Abe, here you go. Here's the command. Go sacrifice your son. Dun -dun. Okay, so you know what we're gonna do? This source we're gonna do together. Because I wanna just pick out laser points about what was going on with Isaac, okay? Um, brave reader who hasn't read yet. Ra uh, Rachel read. Hannah, Hannah, can I call on you? No, yeah? Yeah, it's okay, okay, page four, go ahead. Sometime afterward. Sometime afterward, God put Abraham to the test. He said to him, Abraham, and he answered, here I am. That's the Torah's way of saying, at your service. Okay. Okay, why does it say he got up early the next morning? Could be far. To yeah. sneak out. To sneak out? Maybe. God gives you a command to kill your son. Oh, by the way, I have, my wife and I have seven daughters and one son. Okay, what? what? No one sees you. No one sees you. Okay, could be. Well, the kid's still sleeping. Kid's still sleeping? But he's got to bring the kid with him. Ah, uh, 37. Good point. <laughs> yeah. Well, some of these people, 37, they're already like still sleeping. Yeah? Maybe he couldn't wait to oh. do what God says. I don't know about you, but if, I, if God gave me a command to kill my son, I would be like, whoa, ho, got a lot busy today. Things on the schedule, God. Whoa, I, you know, maybe we could push it out and do it a little later. No, oh, I have a busy appointment. What's that? Checking my, uh, what do you call it? Uh, football score. Uh, the um, fantasy. fantasy football scores. You know, uh, you know, I got a lot going on, God. You know, sacrifice my son. Okay, I'll see you later. Says the Torah, I'm on the spot. I'm getting up early to fulfill, even though I don't want to do it. I'm going to, you say jump, I say hi. Okay, so it goes off. Excellent. Keep going, Hannah. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place from afar. And then Abraham said to his servants, you stay here with the ass. The boy and I will go up there. We will worship and we will return to you. Okay, qu big question. The commentators, what did Abraham mean? He, he, what did he mean by that? It could be like his deep, deep, he knew it was going to be okay, but still nevertheless, because he really, didn't know what he was, that they were going to return. Maybe he was just saying to put him off. Okay, come to struggle with that verse 5 in terms of what Avram was actually saying because he was actually going to go kill him. How could he say we will return to you? Okay, keep going. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and put it on his son Isaac. He himself took the fire stone and the knife and the two walked off together. Okay, so the two of them walked off together. Everything's great. At this point, does Isaac know what's going on? No. No clue. Verse 7. Hannah, you're doing such a good job. Thank you. Keep going. Um, then Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father, and he answered, Yes, my son. And he said, Here are the fire stone and the wood, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? Okay, if you can't tell me now, I do like sports. So imagine, here we go. We, we're, you're, uh, it's February 1st, 2nd, whenever the Super Bowl is this year. Okay, and um, you, you buy tickets to go to wherever it's going to be. You, up in the hotel. You, the, you go to the set. You're tailgating a few hours. You got, where is it this year? Miami? Yeah, my name, okay, tailgating, great, suntan, the whole thing, right? <laughs> Dolphins won't be in it, it's okay. Anyway, but, uh, right, and then you're ready to go, you've been tailgating, drinking, eating, this, uh, and all of a sudden you're like, hey, hey, Dad, where are the tickets? Uh, okay, there were no e-tickets then, okay, whatever, okay, okay, he doesn't have the tickets. So this is like, Isaac's like, we just traveled three days, we came to like, the most important thing over here, like, Dad, Where's the beef? You know, like, where's the lamb for the sacrifice over here? What's going to be slaughtered to be brought to the Almighty? What does Abraham say very cryptically to him? Next verse. And Abraham said, God will see to the sheep for his burnt offering, myself. Okay, and without going on too much, that was when Abraham gave him a little wink, wink. 
God will see who will be the offering. Wink, 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 wink. And if we don't find a lamb over there, it's going to be you. And now what does it say before you turn the page? I know you have all turned the page. Turn back just one second. Because then the Torah says, and the two. Okay, that, oh, hold on, personal foul. Unnecessary repetition in the Torah. The Torah never repeats itself unless it's necessary. Oh, didn't it just say in the end of verse 6, the two of them went together? Fact check. Yeah, what does it say? Yeah. Right? Two of them walked off together, two of them went together. I don't like that. Two of them went together. And now the verse 8, the two of them went together. Hold on, I already know they went together. Why does I need to say it again? Because now Isaac knows that he's going to be the, uh, the sacrifice. He's going to be the offering. And he went with the same willingness after he knew as before he knew. Okay, let's ask ourselves this same question we asked before. I don't know about you, but if I knew that I was going to be in Isaac's shoes, what would, uh, I'd be like, uh, whoa, dad, can we take a little time out? I'm going to go talk to mom. Like, you know, maybe we'll go to a little therapy. Like, can we like work this out? I, I, like, I would not necessarily be eager. Isaac went forward with the same alacrity, the same eagerness to do God's will as he, as he did before he knew. Okay? And therefore, this is where Isaac, our patriarch, represents what? <coughs> dedication to God. He is the perfect model of our dedication to, to God. So let's carry, let's f continue the board. Wanting to be like God, what was the sin? Chava wanted to be like God and sort of like take over. And what is Isaac represent? I'm totally your servant. I am your at your beck and call. Okay, so Isaac was, uh, no, put it down in the middle. Yeah, right there. Yeah, it's going to go down. Yeah, yeah, no, no, in the second, middle box. Right there. Perfect. Exactly. So Isaac is going to be, um, Yitzhak is going to be re representing our relationship with God. He is the one who is going to represent that. Okay? Um, okay. The final patriarch we're going to see, turn the page to page um, actually, no, it's on the same page at the bottom, page 5. Okay? It's going to describe Esau and Jacob. These are the two sons of Isaac. And we are going to see, and you can write here, relationship with God underneath Isaac. Okay? Because he's going to rep represent that. Okay, the final one is going to be Jacob. Okay, brave reader. Gennady, can I ask you to read? Source 2C. One line. Very easy. When the boys grew up. When the boys grew up. Esau. Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the outdoors, but Jacob was a wholesome person dwelling in the camp. Okay, so here we go. You got two characteristics of her. Esau is like, he's pumping iron. <sighs> you know, okay, he's like doing, um, you know, Spartan races. Okay, he is uh, hunting. He is, that's his personality. What is Jacob doing? He's a homebody. What is he doing in those tents? There's a sort of a code word in the Torah when we say ohel. The ohel always, the tent, always represents Torah. Yaakov was bent over, slouched, over his Gemara, over his Talmud, right? Which didn't exist then, but okay. He's over his books of study. He is the ultimate spiritual individual. Okay? He is the one that is totally focused on self-improvement and self-perfection. Because that's ultimately what we're doing when we're learning Torah. We are improving ourselves. This is what we're doing right now. We're actually, believe it or not, live on the scene, we're actually improving ourselves right now. We're activating our neshama, our soul, and that is what Jacob was doing. Okay? So curious, sorry to bother you again, but if you look over there, what we're going to see is that in the third category, Jacob represents one's relationship with oneself. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the cat is out of the bag. There are three primal relationships that exist. Every relationship you have in your entire life will fit in to any one, must fit into one or more of those. Okay? Abraham represented chesed, kindness, his relationship with others. Isaac represented a relationship with God, something greater than us. And Jacob represents the perfection of the relationship with oneself. And you can think right now, any possible relationship will, by definition, fall into any of those categories. Okay? Your siblings, your parents, your boss, your 
uh, how you feel about yourself. The negative voices that are speaking, limiting us in our potential of who we can be. That's a relationship with ourself, okay? The ability to be disciplined, to access what we're supposed to, to not eat what we're not supposed to, to not hang out with people we know that are bad for us. That's self-control, okay? That's a relationship with oneself. And this is, ladies and gentlemen, the key to a balanced and healthy life. Now, I know we had to do a lot of text to get there, but I want to show you that this is going to be the framework for the rest of the course. We are going to be focused on these three relationships. Relationship with God, relationship with ourselves, and relationship with others. Okay? And so now, as we go, and I want to conclude in a couple minutes, I want to see a couple more sources, how this actually plays out, these three, so, these three relationships, um, as we go on. So here we go. Um, okay, let me stop. Questions. I'm throwing a lot at you. Why was, uh, why did Ishmael get the part of the stick? Ishmael, um, why was he not favored? Well, Ishmael was not favored because he was not up to snuff. He didn't live up to, you know, it's a, it's a meritocracy. You know, it, the bottom line is the Torah does not, it, it's a very brutally honest book. Yishmael was not on the spiritual level to be able to be the progenitor of the Jewish people. Bottom line. But his brother Isaac was. Isaac himself had two sons. One of them was worthy, one of them wasn't. Okay? By the way, Jacob had 12 sons. Those are the 12 tribes. He was the first and the only patriarch who had all of his children who were, remained Jewish, part of the Jewish people. Avram had a son, Ishmael, who went went off, and Isaac had a son, Esau, who went off. Okay. As a crazy aside, by the way, Ishmael went off, eventually founded Islam. Esau went off, according to the rabbinic tradition, became Rome, which is the Christian tradition. Avram is called the father of many nations. All three monolithic religions trace themselves back up to Avram. But we are the chosen ones. Okay? It's led to a lot of fights the last 2,000 years, okay? Okay? But we still hold firm in our position. We've actually paid for it in blood, sweat, and tears. But nevertheless, we carry our mission on with pride. Okay. So this is where we go. So I want to I wanna plug in now to, um, here we go, the bottom of page five. Are we ready? Okay. Shimon the Righteous. Okay, Rabbi's turn to read. Shimon the Righteous was one of the last men of the of the Great Assembly. He used to say, the world stands on three things. The Torah, temple service, and acts of loving kindness. Can we line this up? Can we line this up in our chart? Next chart. Right? Next thing in the chart. Sure. Three things. Ready? <laughs> Curious on Instagram posting. Okay. Acts of loving kindness. Who, where's that going to be? There you go. There you go. So you could see... I want you to write acts of kindness right next to, in the next, yeah, we're going to have another chart there, another cell. We might have to wipe out that Wi-Fi, but okay, we can't do that. Okay, whatever. We'll extend over there. Okay, there we go. There we go. Okay, very good. Now, what about temple service, prayer? Which one would that be? I'm sorry? With ourselves. Oh, so it's interesting. So prayer can be exactly, and it was a, the meditative part of it. With the service of God. The, the service of God. It's prayer is directly a conversation with God. Excellent, Melissa. So good. So that would be prayer. Okay. And the final one, what does Torah? Torah, we said before, is the ultimate way that we determine for us what's right and wrong and how to live an elevated spiritual life. So when people say, oh, I don't like learning Torah, it's like they haven't tasted how unbelievable it is. And what does it do? I, I'll just give you an example. One quick example of one of my rabbis, rabbis, rabbis. He was known for having f food, food served, whatever, dinner, whatever it was, lunch. And, you know, we make blessings before we, we eat, thanking God for the food, but he literally would wait before making a blessing. And people say, Rabbi, why are you waiting? And he went, Basically, what comes out is he was making sure that his animal self wasn't just ready to dive in. He wanted to make a conscious decision that he was going to eat this food. And he was going to wait until he was totally in control. And then he was going to go ahead and make the blessing to eat. That is a Torah personality, one that's totally in control of oneself and not pushed by external factors, okay? So there we go. There we have it. Three. Now, here is we're going to see the flip opposite. Turn to the top of page six. And dun-da-da-da! -da -da.
further in Mishnah and Pirkei Avos. Here we go. Um, one more brave reader. Rachel, can I call on you? Is that okay? Sure. Top of page six. Okay. This is going to be the flip opposite side of what's going on over here. Okay, perfect. So source for? Source for, right at the top. Starting the, it's, I'll even give you the name. Oh. Rabbi Elazar HaKapar. Said envy and the desire for honor take a person out of the world. Do you know what? Hold on. The English left out one something. Envy, Kina, Taiva. Oh, excuse me. Um, here, everyone take your pen. Here's what we're going to do. Bad translation. Um, and take, cross out four. Put a comma after desire. And then put and where the four was. So I'll tell you how this should read. Envy and desire. You can take out the the. Boy, oh boy, they botched this. Okay, envy, desire, and honor take a person out of the world. Okay, so what does it mean? Envy. What's envy? Ooh. Jealous. What? How are they different? It could be. It could be, by the way. It's translated both ways. Go ahead, Rachel. Yeah. <laughs> the other day. Um, jealousy is like you want what the other person has and envy is you want I think of it as like more the situation of what you're yeah you, you want to be like you want to be in that situation 100% both of them both of them exactly both of them deal with this same thing it is a breakdown in what the relationship with yourself. Oh, interesting. You say yourself. It could be a breakdown, right? You see, they're going to be. It could be a, why it's a breakdown in relation to yourself because you can't control yourself. But fundamentally, the 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 arrow is pointing at another person. So you see, that we're making categories, but there's overlap, right? Each one, each one is uh, fungible. Okay. So so you're jealous of another person. It's a breakdown of your relationship with others. Then what is it? Then desire. This is the same word that we had with Eve, Chava, earlier. The fruit was a desire, a tava, the desire. So that's going to be the relationship with yourself. You cannot control yourself. And finally, um, honor, the quest for honor, the quest for being the best to lord over others. That is going to be the breakdown in my relationship with God. Instead of God being the CEO of the universe, I'm the CEO of the universe, okay? And so we see over here time and time and time again are these three patterns. I want to finish off with one final column. You ready? Okay. The final column is our three topics tonight and for the rest of the, ser of rest of the, of the seminar. Okay. What did we say? Mindfulness. Mindfulness. Our relationship with? ourselves. How are we? Wh what am I doing? How am I doing? Wh am I overloaded with technology? Can I, can I stay focused? That's the mindfulness. Yeah, you got it. I think one. I think one. Okay. Then, okay, we're going to leave business for a second. Then relationships, obviously, is relationships with others. That's the top one. And then the final one is a little funny. What about business and career? How is that going to be reflective of my relationship with God? Yes. All right. Yeah, why? Our purpose. It has to do with our pur purpose. Right. Some people think that their purpose in life is only to make money. Okay, excellent. I want to share with you, let's do this last source together, just part of it, uh, page six. Do you know that there's a final exam at the end of your life? And mine. You go up to the pearly gates. I don't know if Judaism has pearly gates. I don't know. But it has some sort of, some sort of something. And we have six questions that were asked. But the good thing is, we know what they are. The Talmud tells us what the six question is. Do you know what the first question is when we go up to the non-pearly gates? It's in bold. It's in English. Do you conduct business basically? 
Did you conduct business faithfully? Were you honest in business? Were you ethical? Now, I have a question. I, I, of all the things in Judaism, would that be the number one question? You're asked at the end of your life, performance review for 120 years? I would say, were you a nice guy? Were you a loving husband or wife? Were you a good mom and dad? Were you... No, 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 no. Were you honest in business? Why is that number one? It's such a capitalistic question as well. Oh, love it. Why is that the first question? Because that's what you Okay, okay. Well, I mean, murder might be a little worse. <laughs> okay, okay, so depend. So fraud, okay. So what Zach is getting as false, I think if I don't... It's like a crime of like, truth and dishonesty. Yeah. So that goes to your inherent, cult, like your value. Your exactly. Value. What is at your core? Do you believe that there is a CEO of the universe who is on Rosh Hashanah writes in how much money I'm going to make? And if, and, and if so... What's your character? Exactly. Then I am not in charge of my results. I'm in charge of the effort that I put in. And therefore, if I believe that God is the one who is responsible for my ultimate success, then therefore I'm not going to cheat anyone. Because the one who's providing for me doesn't want me to cheat. And the one who's providing for me wants me to stop working once a week. So I'll go ahead and do that. But if I'm the man or if I'm the woman, if I am in charge of everything, if I am God, then I got to make the money no matter what. And I'll cut corners, and I'll never stop, because ultimately I'm in charge. When I swipe this phone on Friday and turn it off, I'm fundamentally, not just me, everyone who does, is fundamentally saying, I'm not the boss. I'm the boss of my life for six days a week, but you know what? I recognize there's a boss above me. So when you come up to the pearly gates after 120, the Almighty asks you, were you honest in business? Because it's the ultimate litmus test, the, the pulse taker of, did you believe in me? Did you believe in me? Because the drive for money is very intense, okay? So there we go, folks. You have the life seminar connected all the way back to the original sin of the three areas that broke down in humanity. And our patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, are those that, re, that fix those uh, wounds. And we are carrying that torch through history. And these three aspects that we're going to look about um, in this seminar are going to be those Three things, excellence and balance and a relationship with others, relationship with God, relationship with ourself. Thank you all. You are awesome. Way to go. Beautiful. Okay, we are going to take now a couple minute break. Yeah, okay, thank you. Beautiful. Give yourselves a round of applause. You actually finished an intense study. Now, I usually don't start this intense textual, but I'm like, you know what? We're taking the training wheels off. We're going to go straight for the jugular. You guys are very intelligent, so I went for a very textual opening class. Most of the classes will not be this textual, but I really wanted you to see that we're not just making things up. It's in the text. It's there.